Oh, howdy y'all. Grab yourself a drink. It is time for some Path of Exile discussion. Welcome to day eight of Spoiler Season for 3.21 and the Crucible expansion. Today is an interesting one. We have one of the most fun divination cards, albeit one that I think will be very rare and not really worth all that much, and that is Matryoshka. Also, the Adrenaline Stance Stance is gone. More on that one later. There's all of the information on the tiering of maps in the new Atlas, and also a number of additional questions have been answered by GGG over on their recently asked questions thread. I'll put a link to all of that down in the description below. But let's start by talking about Matryoshka, this really, really fun divination card. Absolutely love the artwork on this. The artwork on divination cards has been consistently outstanding in Path of Exile, but this is taking it up another level. This thing looks amazing. Anyways, the concept of a Matryoshka doll is that it's a doll that when you open it up, it has more dolls inside. And that's exactly what we see here, except here it is a cat. Now, this is an interesting item in that it seems to give you something that if you don't know a lot about the ins and outs of some of the weird items in Path of Exile, you might think couldn't normally exist. An Onyx Amulet with four anointments? What's going on here? Well, this would have started its life as Strangle Gasp. Strangle Gasp is a very, very rare item. This is something that you can only get from Blight Ravage maps. That seems like you get it from one in a hundred Blight Ravage maps or something like that. You can also get it from Divination cards by killing the Infinite Hunger. Again, that divination card is very rare, and so most players won't see a Strangle Gasp unless they elect to very heavily specialize in playing Blight content specifically. Now, Strangle Gasp has the interesting text, can have three additional enchantment modifiers. So if Strangle Gasp ceases to have that mod, then those additional enchantments that couldn't normally be rolled on it can stay there. And that's what would have happened with Matryoshka. This amulet began its life as a Strangle Gasp, it received four anointments on it, and then after that point, it's then been qualityed up and fed to Elva's Double Corruption Chamber. One of the possible outcomes when you feed an item to Elva's Double Corruption Chamber is that it is converted into a rare item. That rare item will have four, five, or six mods, and it will have exactly one influence on it. This influence can be Shaper, it can be Elder, or it can be one of the four Conquerors. So, that is the origins of where this item would have come from. Now, on top of that, it will be incubating a Talisman item because we heard you like amulets, so we're going to put an amulet inside your amulet. And that, of course, is the Matryoshka theme. Now, what sort of quality is the item that comes out of this going to be? Broadly speaking, it is going to be a pretty incoherent mess of an item. When people take a Strangle Gasp and quad anoint it, then try and corrupt it into a rare, what they're usually hoping to do here is to get four specific anoints that are very general and work well with each other. Then, if the rare item has bad mods, then you would use it as Mythic Orb Bait, and if the rare item has good mods, then you would equip it as is, or sell it to someone else who's likely to use it. But in both of those cases, it's very important that the four anointments have a lot of synergy with each other. What would you do, on the other hand, if you turn in a set of Matryoshka, and then your reward provides you with one anointment that is Mana Leech, one anointment with Spell Damage while wielding a Staff, one anointment that is Attack Damage with a Bow, and a final anointment that is Mace Specific. In short, you end up with pretty much nothing. And that's going to be the problem with Matryoshka most of the time. It's going to be a lot of fun to turn this card in, but I don't expect that you will get very much in the way of powerful returns, and you won't get many things even that are Mythic or Bait. If you do compile a set of this and turn it in, you'll be turning it in not for the item you get, but for the laughs that you get along the way. And ultimately, that's a worthwhile reason to turn it in. I also think this is going to be one of the very rarest Divination cards in the game, and that's because the Divination card for Strangle Gasp is rarer than the Apothecary, and Matryoshka provides not just a Strangle Gasp, but one that has a very specific Double Corruption Chamber outcome on it. Broadly speaking, GGG seem to make Divination cards that have specific Corruption Chamber outcomes on them about 15 times rarer than they would otherwise be, and as a result, this is going to be a staggeringly rare card. Definitely Trade League only, but definitely something that will be a lot of fun, and really makes me think of the Divination card Fateful Meeting that was added in 3.9. So the next piece of news was the item filter information. Whilst this information is of a fairly technical nature and is mostly of use to you directly if you're the sort of person that edits your own loot filter, not even using Neversync's tools, but if you do it from scratch, this information then is very important. For most players, you can mostly ignore this, except the two things that are important here. The first one is the names of all of the new divination cards, which isn't really that much information. We already knew Brother's Gift, we already knew Matryoshka, so we know to wait for Soul Quenched, Poison Faith, and a Chilling Wind, but we don't know anything more about them. But then we have the big information, which is all the tiers of all of the maps that are available in this league. Now remember that with Void Stones, a one Void Stone Atlas adds three to all of these tiers, a two Void Stone Atlas adds seven, and a three Void Stone Atlas adds 11, 
but in each case you can't go over tier 16. So for instance, Phantasmagoria map, tier 6 with 0 Void Stones, tier 9 with 1, tier 13 with 2, and tier 16 with 3 or more. Now some of the most interesting things tend to be what the tier 16 maps are, and we have Coves there as an excellent map. So this means that any undesired tier 16 maps you wind up with will on average be able to be turned into a Coves map for about 4 Horizon Orbs. Additionally, this will have a big impact on farming your first 6 Link of the League, some of this information. I'm going to put a link down in the description below to a separate video that I did. That covers all my thoughts on the best ways to farm a 6 Link early in the League, and this will apply equally to Solo Self Found and Trade. It's probably a bit more important in Solo Self Found, because in Trade, you can always just get someone else to do that farming for you, and circumvent it by buying the items from them. And the next thing is the recently asked questions. The single most important of these is what's happening with Stance Dancing. The gain adrenaline for one second when you switch stance mastery seems too strong and also seems a lot of not fun to use. Will you change it? The answer is yes. The stats for that mastery are now. Remove damaging ailments. So this means this is a cleanse of bleed effects, it is a cleanse of ignite effects, and a cleanse of poison effects when you change stance. And in addition to that, stance skills have a drawback of six additional seconds on the cooldown. I think this is quite niche. This is not complete garbage as many people have been saying, but it is something you will outgrow. The purpose of using this is going to be to gain access to a way to cleanse painful bleeds while you're going through the campaign. As a bonus, it will also get ignites and poisons, but it's the bleeds that are the one that will kill you. Ultimately, at some point in endgame, you're going to want to start rolling real flasks that have bleed cleanse on them, and at that point you'll probably have enough chaos resistance that you don't really care that much about getting poisoned, and you'll also have capped fire resistance so you'll be less concerned about being ignited. However, Expedition content is particularly bad when it comes to inflicting ignites and poisons on you. So if you're running Expedition content, this is an additional early on get out of jail free type card that you can use. So that's the sort of situation in which I would use it. That said, do not just stuff a stance into your build if you're running Expedition in order to use this mastery. I'd only consider this mastery as something to take if you are already running one of the stance skills. You're already choosing to run that and then this is an extra little bonus that it gains as something of a get out of jail free, especially for those 10 second bleeds, 10 second ignites and the like in Expedition content. So yeah, we're not going to have a situation where the most optimal way to play Path of Exile is going to be to injure your wrist by constantly left clicking, and that is a huge improvement no matter how bad this mastery ends up being, because I do think this one is pretty niche. So, what happens with the Dancing Dervishes Crucible Tree Passives, i.e. do they apply to the minions, or do we just count as unarmed and get nothing when it's summoned? When your Dancing Dervish is manifested, the stats on the weapon passive tree are granted to the minion instead of being granted to you. Are people who use two-handed weapons at a disadvantage when it comes to crucible passives when compared to those using two one-handed weapons or a one-handed weapon and a shield, etc.? No in theory. GGG's answer is that two-handed weapon trees have stronger passives than one-handed and shield weapon trees. In fact, they have an advantage in that they only need to craft a single crucible passive tree for their character. I don't think they're going to get the balance on this right, but I can't predict which way they're going to get it wrong. I think they're going to wind up in a situation where one of these options is just objectively stronger than the others, but I think it'll take a little while to figure that out, and we'll probably see, some point in week 2 or week 3 of this league, we'll probably start seeing heavy respecking towards whichever of these options ends up being the best. For example, if it turns out that the shield passives are just incredibly strong, overwhelmingly better than everything else, we'll start seeing people respec out of their two-handed builds into one-hand and shield builds, and we'll start seeing people respecing the rare dual wheel build that exists into a one-hand plus shield build as well. Of course, they might manage to get them closer, and that's what I would hope happens, but I think that would be pretty lucky to see that happen. Uh, what happens with Onigoroshi? This is a low-level item and a one-slash-two-hander. I'm unsure whether to farm it in case the tree is very low level or doesn't give the two-handed tree. So Onigoroshi is a special item. It is a one-handed sword, so it will generate a one-handed sword crucible tree. Its item level will be very low unless it comes from the Rebirth Divination card. And so the ones that come from the Rebirth Divination card set will just be objectively better. In other words, don't farm Onigoroshi. That has been the rule of thumb anyway for the longest time. Onigoroshi is such an inefficient choice of farming target, and really, I don't think anyone ever has fun doing it. So yeah, this is GGG just saying, don't do it. If you want to get yourself an Onigoroshi, then trade for the Divination Card Rebirth. When using the new Blood Price Helmet, how does this interact with other copies of itself in party play? And the answer is the 8% reservation occurs only once. So there's basically no benefit to having multiple copies of the Blood Price Helmet, except that there's a little bit of extra overlap in area. Is the Lord of Steel Jewel available in Crucible? No. 
If two players each take the enemy's permanently take 5% increased damage for each second they've ever been frozen by you, up to a maximum of 50% cold mastery, would the freeze increasing damage taken stack up to 100%, i.e. 50% from each player, if they can both manage to individually freeze the boss that long? No, the maximum to this increased damage taken stat that any given target can have from this effect is 50%, but if a monster is frozen by two or more players that all have this mastery, that maximum will be reached sooner. Will a new snipe gem be available as a quest reward in Ruthless? Yes, it will. It will be available as a quest reward as well as from Siosa's gem shop. Will Hexbloom still work for curses linked to Bane? Yes. Now here's a really important one. Will a saboteur's trigger bots make you pay the mana cost for triggered skills twice? Yes. This one's nasty. This is going to cause a lot of builds, a lot of problems. And it's going to mean that it's even more important to get those Elrion crafts, although you probably already were using them on cast on Critical Strike builds. And finally, how does Manifest Dancing Dervish's skill interact with trigger bots? The skill will trigger from one of the trigger bots, manifesting two dervishes and disabling your weapons. The spell then cannot trigger a second time because you no longer have that spell, so it fails to trigger from the second trigger bot's location. Because the spell only creates two minions and does not deal any damage, the damage penalty on the passive skill that grants the trigger bots has no interaction with this skill. So, that is all the additional recently asked questions, and that concludes all the information for 321 Day 8 of Spoiler Season. Once more, the map tier information is going to have a big impact on your early league strategy in terms of getting yourself your first six link. So I'll put up a link to that video that I put out about getting your first six link in 3.21. That'll be up on screen now. Otherwise, I'm going to leave it there. May your Valobs have interesting results and I will see you around.